I am so grateful for our Nepalese congregation, aren't you? And uh, we'll, at the uh, church meeting on the 28th of November, we're actually marking a significant milestone that the, the Nepalese congregation have reached a point where they, they want to uh, merge their finances with our finances so we will truly be one church. So uh, that's going to be a very significant milestone moment for us as a church and encourage you to make sure you're here with us, 3.30 on that afternoon. I hope you've got the booklet with you. Uh, these, we're pleased to be able to give you these booklets. We've been working on these for a while. One of the things you'll find here at Citywide is that we often use the term calling. And uh, I, I heard from a couple of people, they said, it's still not clear what you mean by calling. So we wanted to take a couple of weeks to see if we can unpack what we mean by calling and the incredible truth that is at the heart of God's call to us. To start off, uh, very simply, calling is not a complicated concept. I found that out on uh, Friday morning as I was just getting comfortable uh, in the little boys' room and the SES rang because uh, uh, they were conducting a, a check to make sure that I was in, you know, you have to leave the house and wave and I had to wake, well, the dogs at that point woke Sophie up and, and we had to go and they wave at you. Uh, when, they, when you're in quarantine, they come and just double check that you're in the right place. Unfortunately, I was in a place where it was going to be complicated, but I, uh, they were patient. Uh, uh, a call is a, a, something that happens when one person wants to reach out to somebody else and communicate with them where they are. And in particular, if you're in the Australian bush and you're lost, what do you call? I think that's actually an Australian thing. Did you know that? Uh, Cooey! Have you heard, who's heard that before? Is there a generation that doesn't know about that? Uh, and when, you, when you're calling out cooey, what are you actually doing? What are you actually trying to communicate? Yeah, this is where I am. Where are you? Come to me or I want to come to you. It, it, and that's really, when, when God uses the word calling, what he's saying is, this is where I am, I can see where you are, come to me, and where I am you will find life. There are, uh, in, up on the first page there, you'll actually see, uh, apparently God uses an Android device to you, I don't know why that is. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, you'll see a couple of verses there, and this call from Paul, and I, I think, my hope is that you can glimpse the significance of what it means to be a called person, where Paul says, live a life worthy of the calling that God has for you. Can you see, it's about our, your calling, one of the mistakes we can make is we think it's about what we do for a job. No, it's about your whole life. Your, live your whole life worthy of the calling. And then this incredible passage in Second uh, Thessalonians where, where it's clear that it is God who is at work in you to fulfill the calling He has on you and that somehow your calling has got to do with your desires, what you want to be doing. And uh, in Second Peter we also see that uh, Peter's saying it's not going to happen accidentally. The whole thing of just stepping into the calling that God has on your life, he says, no, you've got to make every effort. Make every effort. You have an enemy who is very keen for you to stay where you are. And what we need to understand is Jesus is continually calling you forward calling you forward to where he is and where life is. Now, there's a, a passage in the Bible that I think probably best encapsulates the, the vision we have of a church, as a church, as to what the church needs to be. And that is 
uh, you'll see it. We, we've actually got it in the booklet there. On we actually don't don't have page numbers. Maybe in the, ne the next version we might be able to do that. I didn't think of doing page numbers, but we're under the heading, how do we as a church support you in your calling? You'll see both Ephesians, uh, two divided up there, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, really. And one of the things you'll notice here uh, is that there are three levels to the calling that God has on your life in this passage. Up front, what it says is, for some people, the calling that God has for them is to serve the church. Paul uses the categories of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And he says, there are some people who are going to be called to serve you as the body of Christ, whose calling will be to serve the church. But he's also making it clear they're not the main game. Uh, and the outcome of their work is that the knowledge of Christ... And that the starting point of everything, we're going to talk a bit more about this this morning, the starting point of any kind of calling, you'll see we've got a diagram, I don't know if, uh, Kyron, if you're doing it or if Steve's doing it, we can chuck it up, that this, nothing else matters if you don't have a knowledge of Christ. The relationship with Jesus is the absolute foundation. Don't bother talking about what you're going to do with your life until you get that one sorted. That is the... <laughs> That's the most important, you are called to a relationship with Christ. We'll talk more about that. On the basis of that, you'll see it also says, uh, I should, probably shouldn't be moving around on you, should I? Sorry, Karen. Um, that we are called to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That we are called to live like Jesus and what a mature person looks like is somebody who actually lives like Jesus. So the starting point is the knowledge of Christ. The, the next point is the, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And you'll see how the, the passage finishes. It kind of starts this way. It says uh, that these people's job is to equip people for their work of service. And then it finishes by saying, as each part does its work. That when the church is working well, you have your specific call, your specific work. And that is for you to do. But one of the dangers can be we can focus on that and get fixated on that. But if you don't have the other two, like if you don't have the relationship with Jesus, it, there's no point. And if you're not trying to live like Jesus, if you're not trying to, to live as he called us to live, then you'll be dangerous in the world. And the last thing we want you to be doing is to try and represent him in the world. So we, these are the three levels of calling. And we believe as your church that we are, when we're at our best, we're an incubator. We are, our calling as your church is to help you step into and respond to the calling that Jesus has for you at all those three levels. And you'll see there, you can't just blame the church though, because in, in, there in that passage of Ephesians, one of the prerequisites to it all working, the church working as it must, is us speaking the truth in love. that we are called to be the kind of community that calls each other to truth. And this is the vision of our church. It's, a, it's not a simple vision. It's much easier if the vision of our church was to be a Sunday morning service where everybody had a good time. A lot easier to do that. A lot easier if we just had one ministry of the church. But I don't, I don't see how you can read the Bible and think that a church is a ministry. You see, we are called to minister at all these three levels. Now, as I said, the, the, the first level of calling is by far the most important. The first level of calling is, like, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, there really isn't much point talking any further. And that is why if you're not yet baptised, it's it kind of it, it's kind of the firing gun. It's, it's the, where the gun gets fired, and you're off to the races, because because it is 
the point at which Jesus said, uh, and, and the, the, for the early church, it was always the, the starting point where you symbolically say, my life is no longer my own, it is Jesus. That's why baptism is so important for us and for the Christian church for the last 2,000 years. See there, 1 Corinthians 1.9, uh, so you'll see where I, I w- we're looking at this where it says the first level's relationship with Christ sort of looking through and I love this picture Stu did with uh, Hebrews 12 1 and 2 let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith I think that's the best picture of calling that I, I think you can come across there's this lovely sense in which Jesus is a couple of steps ahead of you and he's going, come on, come on, let's go. Let's be in relationship together. Don't settle, don't stop. I'm calling you to the adventure of a whole life. That's what calling means. And as we see in 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful and he's called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Do you get that? I hope that blows your mind. You are called into fellowship with Jesus. The same one that flung stars into space wants to be in fellowship with you. He's looking into your eyes and saying, come on, don't settle. Come on. Come with me on the adventure. As you'll see there in the document, in the little brochure, we we believe that as a church, there are specific things that is our responsibility to you to encourage you on that first level of calling. We, we, well, I, I love the way Robin led us this morning and just helped us come to Jesus' feet. We believe it, it, it is our task to welcome you in, into a times of worship that remind you that Jesus is the centre of the universe and you're not. I think our times of worship on a Sunday morning are vitally important. Because many of us, well, all of us, get full of ourselves unless we come and are reminded that Jesus is the centre and we are not. It becomes really dangerous when church is about personal preference. I, I love the, the quote about community that, uh, by Henry Nguyen that says, community is the place where the person you least want to be with is. Community is the place where the person you least want to be with is. And the church has always been meant to be the kind of community with people of such different backgrounds that there will always hopefully be someone who you find annoying. And it is together with all these people, some of whom you get on well with, some of the people you have to work we don't want to give each other labels but we all know the people in our lives we are extra grace required kinds of people but the, the fact that we come together with people who are not like us at the foot of the cross and take communion together and remind ourselves that Jesus is the center of the universe that is what worship is about giving Jesus his right worth And if we don't do that, then very quickly we become the centre of our lives. Isn't it true? So our task as your church is to have and to encourage us to come and have these times of worship. It is also our task to keep reminding you how much Jesus loves you, no matter what your past has been. It is our task to always remind you that Jesus loves you no matter what your past has been. The grace of Jesus Christ means your past does not have to define your future. It is our task as your church family to 
and this is where it gets a little bit uncomfortable, but to encourage you to speak the truth in love to yourself and to others and to regularly reflect on the parts of your life that are not surrendered to him. We're all on a journey, aren't we? None of us has it together. And if you don't mind me saying, there are parts of your life that are not currently surrendered to Jesus. Isn't that true? If you to be honest. And I hope we will always be a church that causes a little bit of discomfort for those parts. Because we know that life is only found in Jesus. And seeking to protect the parts that are not in Jesus is not going to lead you to life. We also believe that it is our task to encourage and support you to find real relationships with other people for whom Jesus is the centre of their lives. I think that's the task of the church. The the task of the pastor is not to fix up all your problems. The, The task of the church is to help you find real fellowship in the real mess of life. If you feel like you always have to put on a mask when you come to church, then we as a church are not doing our task. We've got to help you find the kind of fellowship where you can be honest and real and speak the truth in love. That's, as I said, that's not with everybody in the church, but we do, our task is to help you find real fellowship. That's why things like dinner together, the kingdom selves, life life groups, all that are, are so central. If your only experience of church is on a Sunday morning, you are not experiencing church and the last thing we would say that our task as a church is to provide the encouragement and tools you need to help you spend the time with Jesus you need to spend unambiguously we we would say if you want to follow Jesus you have to you've got to spend time with him and so we our task is to keep encouraging you and helping you find tools that work for you and find ways for you to spend time with Jesus every day. Life is found in Jesus. I love that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, there is an enemy, the thief. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. We're all on a journey. And my guess is there have been times in your life where Jesus has clearly brought life and brought and things have sort of come into focus. But there'll be and you may even be one of these times right now uh, where Jesus feels a long way away. We want to move just to a time of discussion now. This will be I know for the Nepalese congregation, they won't always spend time in in discussion like this, but we we, want to take this time just to stop and think and ask this question. How have you experienced life through Jesus? Really, how have you experienced life through Jesus? I encourage you, as the Bible says, there's something particularly important about speaking the truth in love, And if you're at a point where you're saying, I I don't know if I have, that's great. Just say that. That means that you're you're, you're, you're off to the races because you're speaking the truth in love. And the Holy Spirit can start to work with that. But we want to say, okay, what does it mean for us? What does this life that Jesus calls us to actually look like? And so just round your tables. If you're online, I'd love it. I've been enjoying putting the comments in and and for those online, I'm sorry to not to be with you online today, but uh, can you, on, I'd love it in the comments online if you could do this. If you could just write down, what, how have you found life through Jesus? Have a chat about that for the next five minutes. I'm always sorry to do this, but we need to, to bring it back. We need to be able to hand back to the band before too long so they can... Uh, lead us in a f- one final song 
But as I was saying, there is just nothing more important than your relationship with Jesus. And what I, I love that he promises, that as you hang on to him, he'll bring you life. And if you're to be honest with yourself, it's all the places where you're not hanging on to him, where you're hanging on to other stuff, that'll be the most anxious, most difficult, darkest parts of your life. The parts of your life where you're able to hang on to Jesus, I think you, your life will back up the truth that he is here, that you might have life and have it to the full. The second bit of the, the calling, uh, that little pyramid diagram is learning to live like Jesus and in many ways what over the last six or eight weeks that's what we've been talking about with this diagram the uh, the process of reflecting recognizing choosing and acting that I, I think quite rightly uh, the the Protestant Reformation pu- pushed back against uh, this idea that you had to do stuff in order to earn your salvation and re- reminded us of the beautiful news of grace. But I, I think in often the pendulum has swung too far. And as I said to you before, we had a remarkable discussion with the, the leaders of most of the churches on the Eastern Shore a couple of months ago now. It was just a real incredible time of fellowship where all of us realized that the church has not done a good job generally in helping people be like Jesus. That we've been so focused on helping people know that Jesus loves them and get, get them to become Christians and come to church. We haven't done a, a good job of what the Bible calls discipleship. And so often... Christians will turn up on Sunday and look exactly like the world on Monday. And so that's why we're having this conversation. And Jesus makes no bones about it. Like he says, I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. He's saying in uh, Matthew, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, he says, anyone who listens to what I say and makes the choice to live their life in the way I'm teaching you to live is like someone who builds their house on a rock. But if you want to pick and choose which bits of Jesus' teaching you're going to live on, it's going to be like someone who builds a house kind of with solid foundations on one half and uh, on with foundations built in shifting sand on another half and that doesn't work well for a house. If you feel a bit pulled apart, a bit divided, it may be because you're building on partial foundations. I, I love that Jesus says, as he gives us our, our marching orders, he says, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples, in Matthew 28. He's not saying, go and make Christians interestingly enough. A disciple is someone who takes on the disciplines of the master. Our prayer for our church is that we will increasingly look more and more like Jesus. And it's because of that that people will look at us and say, what is the reason for the hope you have? That's how we change the world, not through our budgets or our programs or our pastors but by a bunch of people who love Jesus so much that they look more and more like him. That's why we have these follow, bless and share banners because our best attempt at trying to sum up what that kind of living looks like is captured by those uh, words, fast and pray, observing the Sabbath, listening to God, learning the Bible, offering tithe and time, worship, speaking the truth in love, having space, actively listening, reflecting grace, encouraging, blessing people, listening to the Holy Spirit, eating with people, studying Jesus' way and being sent with a purpose. I don't think God is calling you to get all that sorted out tomorrow. But my guess is the Holy Spirit will be prompting you saying, this is the area we're needing to work on. Uh, We gradually are hoping to have little cards. At this stage, we've got them for the follow banner. 
little guides for each one of those behaviours. We can take them where, where your sense is that God is saying, look, I, I want you to think a bit about worship and what that means for you, to take that and, and, and work with that, stick, maybe stick that in the Bible for a year or so and work with God on that. And then maybe it may be that he's wanting to talk to you about eating with people or uh, listening or whatever it is. But we want to be a bunch of people led by the Holy Spirit who look more and more like Jesus. And that's our best attempt at summing that up. We want to be a big greenhouse, a big incubator, so that you are free to grow in the way that God is calling you to grow. It is never too early or too late. Jesus is always a few steps ahead of you and calling you forward. It is with this in mind, we'll talk more about what this means specifically for you next week. But can I encourage you? There'll be a voice in you that is not the voice of God that says, yeah, that sounds a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I just don't have time. Yeah, but, you know, God's asking me to do some stuff I don't really want to do. Can I encourage you? Life is where Jesus is. And it's found nowhere else. Don't hold back. Let's, as a church, spur one another on. Let's not, be, let's not settle. Let's not settle for half-hearted, for clever words for nice singing. Let's step into the adventure of whole life together with our eyes on Jesus. You reckon we can do that? You up for that? Really? You up for that? I think we've got an adventure before us, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Jesus, First, we want to say thank you that you love us. Thank you that you call us into relationship with you. Forgive us for the times we take our eyes off you and put them in other places. Help us, Jesus, be open to the life that is only found in you. And as we keep our focus on you, Jesus, can you help us? really take the space to reflect and help us recognize where we got work to do and help us grow help us be a bunch of people who are growing to more and more look like you help us to be a bunch of people that people look at and say what is the reason for the hope that you have holy spirit we ask you to do whatever you need to do amongst us so that that is true Remove whatever you need to remove amongst us. Free us however you need to free us so that we can truly and wholeheartedly follow. Jesus, we love you and we ask you to move amongst us to free us to step into the life that only you bring. We ask this in your name. Amen.